Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, I would like just to start. I would like to focus on one word in the title. Okay. Can you hear me now? I'll try to. <laughs> Looks like a double seven. <laughs> so I would like to focus on one word in the title: complex. Autism is a complex neurodevelopment disorder, and. Uh, the complexity starts from the definition. Here are some of the words used in the first paper from Dr. Cameron in 1942. And uh, you can recognize something about the deficit in uh, social production, the uh, problems in the uh, abnormal responses to uh, sensorial stimulation, or the repetitive and stereotype uh, movements. But uh, the definition of autism has changed in every edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for uh, Mental Disorders, you see that there are different definitions, not just the, the name, but even the criteria for the diagnosis. And then finally, in the last edition, we can see that some of the original features are still there, that is in social relationship, and then uh, insistence of sameness, stereotype movements, and uh, the hyper or hyper activity to sensitivity. So we're still trying to figure out what autism is. And uh, that is important because autism has a great impact in our society. Both in terms of prevalence, we now have one out of 68 US children, and both in terms of cost. So all this attention is dedicated to autism and is in some way justified this important need. And so what causes autism? Let's say we, we have a very basic symptom. We go to combat, we do a medline, and we have 35, over 35,000. I have to disclose I didn't read them all. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a lot, but not, not very impressive. If you think about similar conditions, schizophrenia has four times more, epilepsy five times more, the combined search for mental retardation, intellectual disability, ten times more. So there is research about autism, but still not that much. And if you think about since 1943, this is an average of about 500 papers per year, which of course is skewed for the more recent years. So let's try to investigate the etiology of autism. And uh, the clues point to a very strong genetic component. And this is based on studies on parented siblings, studies on three. And, uh, and so let's try to investigate what has genetic to do with autism. So when we look for autism and genetics, or autism and genomics, combined, we have one out of three papers that are based on the genetic component of autism. And now this is impressive, because if we go back and look at the percentage of schizophrenia, epilepsy, mental retardation, that's one out of ten. So what are the causes of risk factors that are emerging from all this issue? Well, there are over 800 predisposing genes for autism. And uh, but only one, two cases have caused a single gene mutation. So the idea is that there might be a strong component of modifiers. But then, of course, there are other factors that are hinting uh, at genetic component. The parental age, so there might be factors in the germ lines that might affect the, uh, the prevalence of autism. Or the immune system of the mothers that have been reported in these patients, do they have a genetic component? And, of course, the interaction with environmental factors, such as uh, diet, radiation. <coughs> so, is genetic the, the answer to better understand autism? If it is so, we should be able to find the cause of autism. But if we look at the genetic yield uh, in, uh, in several studies that involve uh, microarrays, CGH, SNP, uh, microarrays, uh, we don't really have a lot of answers. You now, the best case scenario is one out of five cases actually has an answer. So four out of five are still unresolved. And so, what is the solution to that? But, well, researchers started to look beyond single genes, beyond single proteins. And the solution was looking at pathways, identifying target pathways that might be affected. But uh, you can see some of these are closely related to a central nervous system, some of these are not so closely related. But even when we look at the pathways, we're still looking for the single big bad gene mutation that is affecting the pathway, dis disrupting the pathway in time. Now, the approach that I would like to, to present today is a different approach. It is looking at the larger picture. So if we look at the whole metabolism, so far we've been looking 
for the single bad deleterious mutation that is affecting the body. But what about the small, milder mutations that might be present and affecting the same pathway and might have a cumulative effect that might still disrupt the pathway? Or what about multiple mutations that are affecting multiple pathways, but they're still contributing to the same phenotype, like the neurodevelopment? So the first technology that we used in our metabolic approach was the bio phenotype microbe. This is a dynamic test that is based on uh, cells that we obtain from the individual. The cells are exposed to different compounds, and then we measure through a colorimetric reaction the production of NADH. So basically, how much energy the cells produce in the presence of that single compound. And you can see here the color is different from the well, the darker the well, the more NADH is produced. So our measurements are based on the absorbance that we measure at the endpoint at the highest level according to the physical characteristics of the dye and the background level. And also, we are able to measure the kinetic response. So this is based on optical density that is detected every 15 minutes during the 24 hours of incubation of the dye. So thanks to this technology, we are capable of uh, creating these kinetic curves and also to overlap in a case versus control comparison kinetic curves from uh, uh, an ASC individual and uh, and as you can see, when you have overlapping of the two curves, you have yellow. When the controls are higher, you have these red edges. When the patients are higher, you have these green edges. So the idea of this test is actually to see how the cells function, how the cells behave. And uh, when we expose lymphoblastoid cell lines from patients with autism and the controls, different compounds, and we said most of the times there was an overlap. This is the average of the absorbance. But there was a big difference always in wells containing tryptophan, like in this case E7 to F6. And that was confirmed by the statistical analysis. So of all the compounds we were testing, only the tryptophan amino acid was giving us this important difference. And uh, so starting from that preliminary data, uh, in collaboration with the company, we developed a customized plate that has a positive control on the top, which is glucose as a negative control here, and then have to consider every column as a unit in which, after the positive and negative control, we have six wells containing tryptophan, either alone or as a part of a double time. And you can see here this experiment that is based on uh, uh, six replicates for two patients and two controls, that really the color is quite different. You look at the color in the wells containing tryptophan control, and the color in the patients is quite different. And then when we perform the kinetic analysis in the lab, we notice that there is very little difference in glucose, some difference in very little in the empty well, then in the tryptophan wells, you will always have the red edge. So we always have this consistent difference with the patient being less capable of producing energy in the presence of tryptophan when compared to glucose. And so we thought, okay, how do we apply this metabolic approach to the study of tryptophan? to the study of both. So the first uh, approach was, of course, to try to use this difference to develop a screening test, to use this uh, difference as a biomarker. And so we developed some classifier using some algorithms. And this is, this is some preliminary data from some recent studies. <coughs> and you can see we're, we're there. I mean, this is not bad. But still, we have one out of four false positives. So one out of four controls are miscalled as patients. But the interesting thing is that when we look at the single data points, we have a very good discrimination at younger ages. So this is uh, individuals below the age of two. And you can see how the red dots that are the patients are very well distinguished from the blue squares that are controls. Also, we try to expand our approach uh, including uh, other plates that contain other um, doubles, like the ions, uh, hormones, cytokines, and other metabolic effectors. And we notice that actually the performance of our classifier improves. And we now have a specificity of 80%. The sensitivity is pretty much the same. So this is encouraging, and we're now planning to expand to all the plates, to the full platform, our, our analysis. But speaking of that expansion, um, Dr. Andrew Rastava went even further in collaboration with Metabolon. Uh, they performed some metabolomic analysis on different cores. They first started on plasma samples from uh, 100 patients and 32 controls. 
and then they used a preliminary analysis and then they tested that and uh, tested for 83 patients and 76 symptoms. And finally, uh, performing a blind challenge of all those symptoms. So this is, of course, a different approach. It's still looking at metabolites, but this is a more static assay, but a more comprehensive. It has more compounds, has more pathways to are investigated. And these are the uh, results. See this first cohort. Uh, you can see that the blue dots are quite different from the red ones. But once again, if we focus on younger ages, so the light colors that are below the age of 10, you can see that discrimination is much better. And uh, this has been analyzed with the principal component analysis. Another approach with the linear discriminant analysis is showing similar things. You can see again, if you focus on the light color, the patient and the controls are quite different. So in an effort to push even further, younger and younger, they analyze newborns. And surprisingly, newborns are completely different. They cluster in a way uh, just by themselves. And now, as a future project, one of the goals is to actually track down the metabolic profiles of newborns in a prospective study and see how these will eventually move to a feed or to a piece. So this is one of the, the, the future goals that so when you look at the overall analysis from the metabolomic acid, you can see that uh, these are the wells, so these are the compounds that are showing an increased level, and uh, yellow and red, and the ones in green are showing a decrease. There is a pretty good distinction between the patients and the controls, even for the ones that are overrepresented or underrepresented in patients. But also when we look at the compounds we started to identify some pathways, we started to identify some uh, targets. And uh, of course, this is just an association study. So we don't know if these uh, uh, abnormal uh, metabolite levels are a primary factor that is causing the autism or they are secondary effect of the autism. But we thought, okay, so let's look at the significance of our findings in order to investigate the pathogenic mechanism. So if we go back just for one moment to tryptophan, what is tryptophan? Tryptophan is an essential amino acid. That means that we can only get it through the food, through our diet. And therefore, the absorption rate is affected by our microbiome. And uh, abnormalities in our microbiome have been described in patients with autism, as well as, uh, a problem, as in intestinal problems, digestive problems. But also, tryptophan is a precursor of, of several neuroactive molecules, and this is the link to the neurodevelopment. And the patient of tryptophan, both acute and chronic, has been associated with mood disorder. So, what is tryptophan used for? Well, first of all, uh, most of us know about the serotonin and monotonic. The serotonin is the main regulator of mood and behavior, but also uh, it plays an important role in the first trimester of pregnancy in the development of the forebrain and particularly uh, the glutamatergic synapses. And melatonin is the uh, main regulator of the circadian rhythm. And the abnormalities in the sleep awake cycle have been described in all these But if we keep looking, uh, this is actually a famous pathway, but not the main pathway for the tryptophan inside our cells. The main pathway goes down and uses this enzyme here, IGO1 and 2, that is one of the most powerful endogenous inhibitors of the immune system is actually uh, one of the reasons why we are all here, because the fetus uses these to repress maternal immune system and therefore not being attacked when the pregnancy starts. So this is so important that unfortunately it's also playing a key role in uh, tumorogenesis because cancer cells use the same trick to basically escape the response from the immune system. So this is a link to the immune system abnormalities in individuals uh, with autism. But if we keep going, there is this whole pathway here, the cameramine pathway, that has these two compounds as an end product. And the balance between these two, you can see one is neurotoxic, one is neuroprotective, one is NMDA agonist, one is antagonist. The balance is very delicate because it is responsible not only for the development of synapses and the organization, but it's also responsible for the program apoptosis in our cell and nervous system particularly the role of quinolinate is important. And then finally, cryptophan is linked to the NADH itself. 
that is uh, a main energy transporter and is the substrate of the mitochondrial respiratory chain. Now, the involvement of the mitochondrial respiratory chain has been uh, uh, further validated by another experiment that used rotenone, that is the inhibitor of the complex one, which is NADH dehydrogenase. And it proved that adding rotenone to the plates, to the viral plates, actually caused in controls the same metabolic response that we observed in untreated ASD patients. So, when we compare these with the results that we collected, that Sylvester collected from the metabolomic analysis, we noticed that the metabolites that showed some significant abnormalities were pointing towards some target factors. And again, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, and then markers from inflammation and immunity. So you can see how the results complement each other. The important thing here is that while metabolomic is a static analysis that is more comprehensive, so it allows us to investigate more pathways, more compounds, it cannot distinguish between the association caused by a secondary effect or a primary cause. But the cells that are extrapolated from the body that we use for the viral plates are actually proving a functional role because we actually test the intrinsic features of the cells. On the other hand, the cells that are separated from our body may be exposed to artifacts caused by our technology. But the validation from the metabolomic acids is actually proving the metabolites are confirming what we see in the viral plates. So that is why it's so important to have this combined approach. And then, uh, finally, <coughs> The classification of our approach is the treatment. This is uh, still some very preliminary data on 10 cell uh, lymphoblastoid cell lines from individuals with autism and 10 controls. And uh, we test some compounds. Uh, first of all, we try to add more tryptophan or other alternative and resources that either we're using the same uh, uh, transporters or they're just more powerful. And then we use the intermediate mechanical pathway or the compounds that might affect the oxidative metabolism. And the results were the tryptophan. Here you can see uh, patients versus control, you can see the red edges. Uh, tryptophan supplementation in the media was actually able to increase the metabolic response in patients and obliterate those ages. So basically, it was rescuing a normal metabolic profile in uh, uh, ASD cells. And you can see here, these are the untreated controls versus the untreated patients. You can see the significant difference in the tryptophan levels that goes away when we add tryptophan to the media. <coughs> But also another compound, sulforaphane, an antioxidant, was capable of restoring a normal metabolic response to tryptophan, both at 10 and 50 micromole. You see that pink age go away. And uh, it's confirmed, when we look at the statistical data, you can see that sulforaphane at 10 and 50 basically has no differences to it. So, uh, to sum it up, uh, our results point to a significant number of markers affecting mitochondria and the immune response, and this is confirmed both from our uh, metabolomic approach and our biophenotype approach. And uh, when we look at this approach for an uh, application for biomarkers and for a screening test, we can see how uh, the difference is more evident at a younger age, particularly below the age of five. And this is very important because if we consider that the average diagnostic age for autism is around three, this will allow us to uh, actually potentially develop a screen test that might be even effective for early symptoms or even pre-symptomatic screening. And then finally, the preliminary data for our treatment experiments uh, show that increased tryptophan availability and also sulforaphane are capable of restoring normal metabolic performance. And then, uh, these are the studies in progress. First of all, we would like to uh, establish a correlation between the clinical and the metabolic uh, phenotypes and then the genotype. And then uh, this, the first of us have been very, very active with studies on the uh, genome and transcriptome. And then uh, uh, further validation of 550 blinded samples that, if I'm not mistaken, are 300 ASD, 150 controls, and 100 with uh, other neurodevelopmental development, neurodevelopmental disorders that are also here, the prospective study that I mentioned before. And then when we expanded our approach uh, and our platform, the pilot platform, we noticed that the ions are actually showing some significant uh, differences. So uh, uh, investigating the effect of uh, uh, alteration of ion homeostasis in ASD would be another one of our goals. And then testing other compounds for the treatment. And I would like to thank the people that helped us.